Okay, hello everybody. Here we are back at the first slide. Let's power through for part number two, going through the authoritarians. Ah, and here we go, our next section of the lecture, uh, implicit racism. And of course, uh, I want to really talk about a juicy experimental lab-based uh, experiment. And so what I'd like to talk about is this one by Benzeeb et al. And uh, this is from 2014, recent. Uh, and it was conducted at San Francisco State University uh, using the research pool uh, with undergrads. There were two groups in this experiment. One group received educated primes, uh, or the word educated as a prime, and the other, the word ignorant as a prime. Uh, the prime appeared for just 33 milliseconds, barely nothing at all. Uh, then a face appeared for 30 seconds. They were to study the face for the 30 seconds. And then after that, a comparison face appeared for 255 uh, milliseconds and the subjects were asked to respond yes or no if this comparison face was the same face they had studied for 30 seconds. Uh, just as a, a test, uh, what's the independent variable and what's the dependent variable? Uh, so uh, you may want to go back and let me know or answer it quickly or stop the uh, video and answer it. And, uh, you know, again, groups, that's a tip off that we're talking about an independent variable, whether you received educated as prime or ignorant as prime. And the dependent variable, that is whatever the subject, com whatever is coming out of the subject. In this case, it's the response, yes or no, whether or not the face is the same face or not, whether they're correct or incorrect. Uh, and this is a, a complicated experiment, but that should not uh, daunt us in terms of tackling it. Uh, so here's the order of the sequence that images were shown to the subject. Uh, first off, a forward mask was displayed on the computer screen for uh, 67 milliseconds. Uh, that's to basically uh, erase anything in the subject's uh, you know, sensory register. Uh, before they provide the prime. And here's the prime word. That's a P, I guess. Uh, and in this case, it's the educated prime, or educated as the prime, uh, appearing for 33 milliseconds, uh, which I just snapped my fingers. That was like around uh, 200 milliseconds. So that's how quick 33 milliseconds is. Uh, and so the subjects consciously did not perceive it, but we're going to see whether or not it had an unconscious or an implicit effect on their cognition. Then uh, they uh, you know, were exposed to a backward mask. This is, of course, to uh, fill up the sensory register, the visual sensory register, to uh, erase the prime. So. The subjects are only seeing the prime for 33 milliseconds. They can't go back into ICON and retrieve it, uh, which you could do if they didn't have the backward mask. And then for 30 seconds, you see this uh, you know, target face. And you study it for 30 seconds. There is a uh, focusing dot for, 30, for a half a second. And then for 255 uh, milliseconds, yeah, like that long, you see this face here. And then you're asked whether it's a yes or a no. Is this the same face as this guy? If it's yes, press F. If it's no, press J. And they have one second to make that decision, so it has to occur very quickly. So again, very complicated study. Uh, you are able to understand this with some work, and you should. Uh, because you don't get the payoff without doing the work. Uh, and so what they did is they presented in the comparison position here. 
they presented uh, the target. That is, this is the uh, face that they showed as the target. Uh, or they took the target's photo and they photographically darkened it or they photographically lightened it. Uh, and uh, these incorrect faces here are known as lures. Uh, that is to lure the subject to make a mistake. And, oh, I got kind of gave this guy half a mustache, so let's give him the rest. There you go. And uh, so, of course, when they see the target face, they should, of course, answer yes. But for all these faces, the answer should be no, this is not the same face. For all these faces, the answer should be no. And they presented each one of these to each subject four times. So they randomly cycled through presenting these to uh, each subject uh, you know, four times. What the researchers ended up being interested in and looking at and I got to click twice to get my pointer back, my pen back, is they looked at the most extreme lures. That is the lightest lure and the darkest lure. Uh, and this is what they used for the statistical analysis I'm going to show you. So uh, let's start to put this in the context. Uh, again, we have the Ford mask, we have the prime, in this case it's the ignorant prime, the backward mask, the target face, and then uh, the target and or lures, the comparison, and then yes or no. Uh, that is, uh, people are not going to consciously know what this word is, and they didn't uh, in the experiment, but implicitly or unconsciously that word will have some type of effect on the subject's cognition. And the experiment is to see whether or not the word, the prime, has any effect on their cognition related to perceiving this target face here. The idea being that if you choose prime words associated with an African-American stereotype, such as ignorant, uh, or uh, prime words associated with a uh, European-American stereotype, educated, whether or not that would cause changes in how people would perceive this target face. So that's how they did the experiment, and here's the main result I want to talk about here. Uh, this is the proportion of mem memory errors. So the higher the column, uh, the higher the bar, the more the errors. And uh, these are for the darkest lures, and these are for the lightest lures. So these are for only the lures that were at the extreme end of being uh, made dark, and these were the lures that were ex at the extreme end of being light. Now, of course, all subjects should answer no. These were not the comparison I saw, uh, because these are the lures. Uh, and so one final thing you need to know uh, about this graph is these are error bars. And these are presenting the error of the mean. And one thing that you can do is you could eyeball this. And you can say that if, for example, the mean of the other condition falls within two error bars of the other condition, there's no statistical difference or no statistically significant difference between the two groups. And so here, for the darkest lures, there is no difference in the number of memory errors between the different primes. However, for the lightest lures, we see that, yes, indeed, there is, so one and uh, estimating two, yep, there's a difference there. There's a statistically significant difference between uh, uh, the subject's errors in whether or not they receive the educated or the uneducated prime. 
Uh, so again, this is complicated, but we're not going to get the payoff without really working hard. Uh, so let's uh, start to break this down piece by piece. Uh, so we know here that there's no difference in memory errors between the two primes uh, with the darkest lures. What does that mean? And so to understand what this result means, let's go back and reconstruct what they did in the experiment. So here's how the experiments went for the uh, you know conditions that I indicated in the previous graph. So they had the backward mask, no, they had the forward mask. Then they had any prime or either prime, educated or ignorant, it doesn't matter, the same thing happens. Uh, and then they have the backward mask. They show the target face for 30 seconds. Then very briefly, they sure show the dark lure, the plus, uh, you know, 50% uh, lure. Uh, you know, there is no way that this is the same face. And so most people say, oh, no way, that's incorrect. Uh, that's not the same face. And so they are correct in saying that. And so therefore, we have the low level of errors that we see here uh, for the darkest lures. Uh, and also, it doesn't make any difference about the prime. Uh, nothing is changing the way uh, people see this prime face, whether or not they're being primed with a, a word associated with a European-American or an African-American uh, stereotypic word. Now, let's move on to the next uh, part, uh, which is we do have a statistically significant difference between the two primes here with the lightest lore. And so let's take a look here, which is educated. So we have the most memory errors for educated and the uh, a lower level for ignorant. Let's uh, go back and reconstruct what must have happened to subjects in that condition. Uh, so they receive the educated prime, and this primes the, Af the white uh, American, European American, uh, you know, stimulus, uh, ex uh, stereotype, excuse me. And then they get the backward mask, and then they see this face. Because the white or the European American stereotype is primed, this face now seems lighter to them because they've been primed with a white stereotype. And it was an ambiguous race of the face, but because they're being primed with a white stereotype, they're seeing this person uh, as a little bit wider. And so then what happens is we go here and they see the lightest lore and uh, they see this person and they say, oh yes, this is the same person but that's incorrect. And so that's why there is this high level, ooh, the high level of errors here for educated because what's going on is they are perceiving this person as wider as they really are. But what about here in the other lore, uh, the other prime condition, uh, where the word is ignorant, and so they are prime with the word ignorant. It primes the African American stereotype, and so the target seems darker. And when they see the lure, they say, "Oh, no way, man! Uh, that is just too light to be this darker person here." And so they say, "Not really." And that's correct. And so that's how we get the data here. But now, let's go back. Let me clear this up for a second. And let's talk about what this means. So what we see is that there are no difference for the darkest lures in uh, you know, the memory errors when we're talking about 
uh, the ignorant versus the educated primes or the African American versus the white people prom, uh, stereotype. However, here where we're talking about the lightest lures, we see that people are mistaking the target person uh, for somebody who is much lighter significantly more when they're being primed with the word educated. And so when you run into somebody who is educated and you're thinking, boy, this person is educated or he has like a PhD behind his name, this person is educated, they seem wider to you if there's any ambiguity about their race. And that's exactly what the data is pointing to us, pointing out to us. And Ben Zeev et al., uh, they say this. Oh, first off, this is the title of their article. When an educated black man becomes lighter in the mind's eye, evidence for a skin tone memory bias. And they say in the uh, you know, summary of the experiment, the discussion of the experiment, black individuals who defy social stereotypes, that is black individuals who are smarter, are well-educated, have educated degrees, high degrees, black people who defy social stereotypes might not challenge social norms sufficiently, but rather may be remembered as lighter, perpetuating the status quo beliefs. That is, the status quo beliefs are black people are not educated, only white people are. But if you run into an educated black person, what happens is you perceive them as wider than they really are. So when you think about uh, you know, educated people, you still call to mind all of these white people or all of these white faces. And again, this was happening with a prime that was occurring for 33 milliseconds. And that is not long enough for you to consciously perceive that prime. In fact, they uh, checked to see if any of the subjects recognized the primes, and they didn't. And so what that means is these effects are not happening consciously. These effects have to be happening implicitly. And so implicitly, uh, we know a couple things. We know that ignorant and educated are associated to black and white uh, stereotypes in our culture. And indeed, when we uh, you know, run across a uh, educated uh, or we recognize someone as being educated and their race is in question, we remember them as lighter than they really are. And this was done in San Francisco, which would I have to say would be equally as diverse as New York City. And in fact, uh, the uh, you know data presented for the you know uh, uh, sample of the students in the experiment, 36% uh, were white, 21% Asian Pacific Islanders, 20% Hispanic, 9% Black, and 12% other. Uh, so this was not an all-white uh, population; uh, it was a diverse population. Uh, which goes back to what I said before about these stereotypes are in the air. They're in our culture. Uh, they're uh, propagated by uh, the media, by uh, different systems in our culture. And so therefore, this is not something that just white people think, but anybody who lives in our culture are exposed to these stereotypes. And they are not consciously, but unconsciously, affected by them. And indeed, I've asked people to go and take the IAT for race, uh, racial, racial prejudice, and I'm waiting for people to come back and tell me what they got as their scores, because we often have students who are black in our class, in my class, coming back and saying that they have an unconscious prejudice for white people. Okay, so that's it for uh, you know, implicit racism. Uh, let's talk about another of the current theories about racism in social psychology, and that's the idea of racial ambivalence. And we've talked about ambivalence before. We've talked about ambivalence when we were talking about attitudes. 
And indeed, that's uh, exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about racial attitudes and how racial attitudes are ambivalent. Or more specifically, uh, white people's attitudes towards African Americans in America. So just to review, ambivalence is when you have both strong and a negative and positive attitudes about one thing. And when you have these uh, you know, ambivalent attitudes, uh, you're conflicted. And one way of resolving that conflict is using psychological distance to determine whether or not uh, you're going to give in to the positive attitudes or the negative attitudes. Uh, or another way is using trivial situational factors. You can imagine that being ambivalent, you're perfectly balanced, and so one little thing can set you off or you know, tip the scales if you want to continue the metaphor. Uh, this is Erwin Katz's uh, pro-black scale uh, and uh, items on it such as black people do not have the same employment opportunities that whites do. Uh, black people have more to offer than they've been allowed to show. Uh, these are positive attitudes that white people could have about blacks, uh, black people. Uh, and not surprisingly, many Americans, many white Americans, uh, score highly on the pro-black scale. And here is Katz's anti-black scale, uh, the root cause of most of the social and economic ills for blacks is weakness and instability of the black family of black families. Uh, black children would do better in school if their parents had better attitudes about learning. Uh, these are negative attitudes about black people, white people hold. And again, not surprisingly, uh, white people in general uh, score highly on this scale also. So they're high on anti-black attitudes and they're high on pro-black pro attitudes. What that means, folks, is that they're ambivalent about black people. Uh, and so that's what Katz says, white people are ambivalent in America about black people. And so that means that uh, we can figure out how black people, uh, how white people are going to act towards black people by looking at things such as, you know, psychological distance. Uh, and so with distance, and you know, going back to what you know, I said a couple month, uh, a couple weeks ago, when we were talking about attitudes, uh, you know, when something is psychologically distant, the approach, uh, you know, uh, you know, approval systems are stronger, and so you feel positively about that, and the positive attitudes went out. When something is psychologically close the avoidance or the negative uh, systems are stronger and the negative attitudes went out. And so we can see how this racial ambivalence plays out in America by looking at attitudes uh, that about different uh, social topics. White people will have different attitudes about the same things or they'll express different attitudes about the same things based on how you're framing the question. If you frame the question as a general attitude, a general attitude or a general rule, that is psychologically distant. You know, hypothetically, what do you feel about this? Well, that is psychologically way off in the distance. But then, what if you frame it as something happening to your family members? Uh, that is, uh, not hypothetically, but let's say that your daughter has to blank. How would you feel about that? And as the theory says, uh, for a general attitude, uh, that is a psychologically distant thing. And so white people will generally uh, feel uh, positive and pro-black about that. Family members are psychologically close. And so white people will feel negative about that. Well, let's talk about interracial marriage. Uh, when you phrase or frame a question and ask white people if they are uh, you know, in favor or against laws that forbid interracial marriages, the majority of white Americans will say that they are against these laws. 
However, when you frame the question about interracial uh, marriage in terms of a family member, most disapprove of interracial marriage of a family member. So changing the way you frame it in terms of the psychological distance can change how white people feel about it. Uh, when we talk about affirmative action, uh, you know, 35 percent of Americans view affirmative action programs and laws, uh, programs as, you know, uh, beneficial. Uh, however, when you talk about laws that guarantee that, uh, uh, you know, protected classes are able to get jobs, you find that very few Americans are in favor of that. That is, most are against it. So psychological distance uh, is key to whether or not these pro-black or anti-black attitudes come to the fore. And then uh, trivial situational factors are also uh, an issue in terms of whether or not uh, people's anti-black or pro-black uh, attitudes uh, are expressed. Uh, this is a graph from Brown and Reed, 1982. Very interesting experiment. What they did is they used a, a variation of uh, the lost letter technique where they actually put the letters on people's windshields underneath the windshield wipers in a mall parking lot. Uh, they went to a mall uh, in a predominantly white town uh, so they could be assured that most of the cars belonged to white people and then they slipped a uh, envelope uh, with a note attached to it uh, underneath the windshield of wiper of cars and they did this so nobody would notice that what what was going on and so people would just uh, take the uh, letter at a face value uh, the note wrapped around the letter said uh, dear Don uh, you know I saw your car here so I thought I'd give you this important letter now rather than mailing it to you because uh, I know that you really want to see this uh, so I'll see you next week at the uh, in Chicago at the leadership conference and so that was one condition of the independent variable and the other condition same letter uh, and it said dear Don uh, I saw your car here so I thought I'd give you this important letter right now uh, rather than mailing it I know you wanted to see this as soon as you could uh, take care and I'll see you in Chicago next week at the Black Leadership Conference. And so that was the other condition. That is, the only thing that changed between the two conditions is the addition of the Black, as in Black Leadership Conference. And so what that did was manipulate the, uh, you know, person who should have really received this letter. So now you're a white person, you got your car, there's a letter there, uh, you look at it, and it says, Dear Don, oh, somebody mistook my car for Don's car. Okay, that's cool. Uh, now you're left with, you know, the question, should I help Don out by mailing this letter, or should I just throw it away? And indeed, you know, that's the dependent variable, uh, whether or not the letters ended up in the mail. Uh, there was one other, as you know from the graph, independent variable, and that was the cost of helping. Uh, in one condition, uh, the envelope was stamped, so all they had to do was drop it in the mailbox. In the other condition, there was no stamp, so they would have to spend 32 cents, take it home, put a stamp on it, and then drop it in the mailbox. So how far are you going to go to help Don? Uh, and here we see oh, an interaction. So the cost of helping is interacting with the race of the person that these white people think that they're helping. So I'll say that again, uh, the cost of helping is interacting with the race of the uh, uh, people that these white people think they're helping. And so let's take a look at this interaction. Uh, if you thought you were helping a white person, that is, this is the general condition, I'll see you next week at the leadership conference. Uh, if you just say leadership conference, white people are going to assume 
that you know it's just a white person's leadership conference and I, I, whatever and we see that when there was a cost of helping there was a slight decrease from when there was no cost to helping or a lower cost of helping uh, between something like 48 and 42 percent male so if you know you thought you were helping a white person another white person there was literally no effect or a slight effect of whether or not there was a stamp on the envelope or not if there was a cost to you of helping but now look at what happens when uh, you're helping a black person we see a much more amplified or polarized uh, you know relationship between the two variables uh, that is if there was no stamp we see that uh, only 15% of the envelopes were mailed and if there was a stamp 65% of the envelopes were mailed and so what we can do right here is we can just look at the difference between for no stamp white people and black people and that pretty much is racism that is this difference here is racism racial difference discrimination that is based on the race of the person they thought they were helping they helped the black person out at a much lower level than a white person uh, if there was a cost a 32 cent cost to helping uh, but what about here on this other side wait wait well it's kind of there's a difference here so is that racism no no what it is is it's like anti-racism uh, that is white people are helping black people more than they would help other white people now did you hear that white people would help black people more than they'd help other white people yes that's exactly what this difference here is we call this the extra break effect and we see this often I'm gonna sneeze because of my allergies nope nope I'm gonna stifle stifle my sneeze the extra break effect we see this often uh, in you know research like this when we're looking at stigma uh, and the cost of helping and it's that uh, as I was saying we have attitude ambivalence uh, white people have attitude ambivalence about black people uh, and so what that means is that we have strong positive and strong negative attitudes about black people all it takes is something very trivial to set it off but when it's set off when something negative happens it sets it off and causes a racist racist response or a discriminatory response that hurts black people but then when it's set off by something positive it sets off a discriminatory response to help black people more than white people that's absolutely fascinating and amazing and that's what this attitude ambivalence causes depending upon how you trigger it and what triggers it if it's positive white people are going to end up helping black people more than other white people if the trigger is negative white people are going to discriminate against black people compared to other white people and here I just said the same thing and Yep, that's the end of this part two. Uh, we'll wrap up the lecture in part three.